Hello, this is Robert Rickover at Body Learning, and today my guest is Amy Ward Brimmer, who's an Alexander Technique teacher of 17 plus years experience living in the Philadelphia area. She has a background in acting and directing and uh, has served on the faculties of Yale University, the Hart Conservatory, and Brooklyn College. She's also a certified childbirth educator and someone who's read extensively uh, on the technique, and which is relevant to our topic today, which is um, uh, we're going to take a look at a quote by John Dewey, who was a student of Alexander back in starting in actually during World War One, and um, we're going to talk about that quote, which I'll read in a moment. But first, let me let me welcome. Uh, Amy to the show. Hi Robert, happy to be here. Yes, it's it's good it's good to have you uh on the show. Uh I did send you this quote which I'm going to read in a moment. And uh as you said, it did start a train of thinking in 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 your mind that, that we're going to pursue in this conversation. So, I think the best thing would be for for me to read it. Um it's a couple of short paragraphs long. And it it was written, I believe, in the 30s. Uh, so the, some of the examples are slightly dated, but I think it it it's pretty relevant. Actually, it's from the introduction to Alexander's uh, book, uh, published in 1932. So he must have written this back in the early 30s. So here's the quote. Um, Dewey writes. In the present state of the world, it is evident that the control we have gained of physical energies, heat, light, electricity, etc., without having first secured control of our use of ourselves, is a perilous affair. Without the control of the use of ourselves, our use of other things is blind. It may lead to anything. And then he goes on to say, if there can be developed a technique which will enable individuals really to secure the right use of themselves, then the factor upon which depends the final use of all other forms of energy will be brought under control. Mr. Alexander has evolved this technique. Pretty powerful, <clears throat> pretty powerful stuff, don't you think? It's quite a claim. It's quite um. <laughs> a claim. It's a, it's a, it may seem an outrageous claim since the Alexander technique that Mr. Alexander developed is m- generally thought of in terms of helping people with back pain, helping musicians play better, that sort of thing. Not the huge questions of human survival. Um, well, I, as you said, this, um, <clears throat> I've been thinking about this since you sent me this quote, and um, I think that it actually gets to the heart of Alexander Technique, which is really uh, a way of understanding how we do what we do, uh, and understanding that consistent, constant misuse of ourselves over time is what causes our dilemmas and our problems. And so uh, I'm sure Alexander would say it's not what you do, it's how you do it. And so technology, I mean, this was 80 years ago probably or more that Dewey wrote this. um, Mm -hmm. And thinking of our technological advances in the last 80 years and how technology, I mean, we're, we're using it right now to record this podcast and it's, um, we, we've become, we've always been very good with mechanistic technological development. Um, and you know, he, this is on the verge of world war II, um, the rise of fascism. If you put it in the historic context of when Dewey was writing, there was a lot of concern about, uh, the development at the time of nuclear technology and, and the bomb. And, Mm -hmm. um, it's just gotten worse, of course, in that regard as time has gone on. Right. And, And in fact, um, uh, he for Dewey first met Alexander, I believe it was 1916, and I'm guessing that when Dewey wrote this, in his mind was also the previous war, which yes. didn't 
didn't turn out too well for anybody really um and if you, you know if you know anything of the history of that it it was it was insane how it started um and, and a lot of it had to do with technology that um people had not properly thought out like what happens when you change the train schedules in France and Germany to have all the trains going in a certain way for a war to start and there's no way to stop that <laughs> you know i mean yes i mean well, yeah, you know well, that that of course that pales by comparison to pushing a button to launch a, a missile that's going to destroy half the world but you can you can see the the issues that were present then are are still totally with us but the stakes are so much higher um, yeah, they they are in many regards higher. Um, th- that also is about you know very similar to that time, although uh, things happen much f- at a faster rate. Destruction happens at a faster rate now, right. probably. Um, and I think that this just kind of goes to um, one of the core lessons that I've taken away from my work, both as a student and a teacher of Alexander Technique, which is that uh, it gives us the opportunity to discover what is actually in our control and what isn't. And mm-hmm. um, I have also found from my mindfulness practice that there's so much in the outer world that's beyond my control. There is um, really only myself and my own experience and my own response to what arises moment to moment that that I can work with. Um, it's also very liberating. It seems, it seems um, like it's not much. Um, but I, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things we could say about this, but I think that, um, the mindless, uh, development and deployment of technology, whether it's, you know, for military and warfare purposes or, um, to, uh, extract fossil fuel from the earth to burn or, um, people who become obsessed and are online all day, um, you know, it, technology is a tool, but used mindlessly can be extremely dangerous um, and certainly takes people away from um, true living, truly living. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a lot of different things that I could say about this quote. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that when we look at um, F.M. Alexander's discovery of um, reducing the interference that we place on ourselves. If you, for example, can learn to sit in a way that is in alignment with how you're designed to sit, if you can walk, if you can uh, sweep a floor or shovel a driveway in the winter um, according to how you're designed, um, that that's possible because your uh, thinking in activity, you're with yourself in that activity. Your mind isn't off doing something else while your body is working. And I think that uh, that might be what Dewey is pointing to here is that uh, the basic principles of applying Alexander's work to our daily habitual use of ourselves has implications. If, if everybody was able to do this, if we could bring the Alexander Technique to a wider number of people and we were all applying the principles as often as we could uh, throughout the day, our our thinking changes and thus our behavior changes. And I think all the wisdom traditions of the world say the same thing. Um, So that's a pretty big claim as well. (laughs) Right, (laughs) right. Well, there was that has been my experience. There was an early student an early American student of Alexander's, I think his last name was Lee, who um, proposed that all the president and all members of Congress be, as he put it, be Alexanderized. Um, <laughs> didn't really happen. But let me let me just play devil's advocate here for a moment. I think I think a lot of people familiar with the Alexander technique would totally get that um, by using these these principles, you can improve the way you function the, on a physical level. You can do things more effectively. You might even 
uh, you, 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 you could make better decisions about how you deployed your body to do things. Let's put it that way. Okay. But then what they might say, well, now, let's say uh, the president is sitting at his desk and sure, if he had Alexander lessons, he could sit more effectively. His breathing would probably improve. But why, why should we imagine that his decisions, and of course him and all the other people who make the kind of decisions that bring about these issues, why, why, could we, why should we think that his decisions are going to be better? Yes, he'll be more effective, perhaps, in carrying them out. But why, why would they be better? That's an excellent question. And I think if I imagine myself in the Oval Office in that position, um, which I don't, not a picture I want to stay with very long, but if I were the president and I um, knew how to use the Alexander Technique, mm -hmm. day to day, mm -hmm. um, I'm just picturing the kind of pressure that someone in that position is under and the number of voices that would be pressing their agenda on me to do what they would want me to do, to decide what they would want me to decide. And I think this is not necessarily only for the president. It could be someone who's a head of a company or in a position of responsibility or, 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 con or a mother. Con Congress, but people in Congress <laughs> or military people, the same thing. Or, or a mother at home with sure. a couple of kids, right. you know, mm -hmm. saying, let's mm -hmm. do this, let's do that. In those moments of pressure uh, where a decision does need to be made, uh, the Alexander Technique gives us the opportunity to pause and to become clearer in the moment um, and not be quite as reactive, not be quite as um, pulled in one direction or another, but to be clearer and more centered in our own self. Now, the president might not make a decision I would agree with, uh, just like a child might not agree with what a mom uh, would decide uh, whether to buy something at the grocery store or not. But in those moments, you are able then to to be freer and clearer in your own mind um, as you're freeing your musculator, musculature and, you know, standing in more balance. Um, you're able to be uh, more authentic and available to yourself. And in that sense, I think the decisions would be better. Um, they would be more true to the person making the choice. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you, you would have to hope that, the, that uh, the, the people of the country who elected that person would elect someone who had a better kind of core value system or, you know, because if he, he could be someone who was, who was, uh, you know, crazy, and they, they could get closer to their core values and and do something not so helpful, you know, that's, I mean, that's that I mean, is possible. That's a problem too. But <laughs> but I well, think what you said about the pressure, uh, I mean, from my limited knowledge of how the White House works, uh, there access to the president is this thing you have to go through lots of hoops to get even for a minute or two because there's so many people who want to tell him want to suggest something or put a certain argument to him and so he's got he he I he must have as you said all of these voices telling him things sometimes in direct opposition to each other and his job is to weigh them and make what he th feels is the best decision and not be influenced, I guess, by the pressure of the moment to come up with something quickly that's not going to be helpful. It's dealing with that kind of um, external pressures and not letting it create internal stress, I, I suppose is one way of putting it. Exactly. Well, and I think I think <clears throat> thinking more about what Dewey was saying about what Mr. Alexander had developed a method that could, you know, give us the chance to use ourselves better <clears throat> and thus maybe be more conscious of what it is we're developing in terms of controlling the external forces of heat and light and gravity. <sighs> and, you know, I mean, we've been to the moon we're we're at Mars. We've got something up on Mars now. I mean, we've, we go deep sea 
exploring. There's there's a lot that's happened since Dewey even pointed to this. And I think that what he's saying is um, what what good is it to be able to control the forces of nature if we don't recognize our own need to control and have good use of our own nature. Mm-hmm. It's, it's our own nature that he's really pointing to. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, I could, we could make an argument that, that someone at the level of the presidency or Congress or the top CEOs in corporations, um, if they really understood and began to apply Alexander Technique, the whole structure of their, sy- their systems might change. Um, because really... <laughs> My experience with Alexander Technique and the use of the self um, is often at odds with our broader cultural um, sort of systems of things. And so, you know, democracy itself might even change. Um, wow, actually, we're, we're really... We're, <laughs> that's a whole different podcast. <laughs> we're, mo- we're, moving at, we're moving into a much higher sphere here. But I don't, so, I'd actually so that don't... I'm dis- not, I have no, I have no right. evidence of that. That's just I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't disagree. <laughs> but, you know, I think, um, I do think it's possible to see a correlation between physical stiffness and mental rigidity in people. Um, I've noticed that people who seem kind of rigid in their thinking typically, I won't say always, but typically are pretty rigid in how they hold their bodies and how they move. And, you know, the other thing that kind of jumped out at me when you were talking about what what you th- you felt Dewey meant by that, I believe it's Dewey's wife who, in an inter- after Dewey had died in an interview with Frank Pierce Jones, who wrote... A, a pretty important book about the Alexander Technique, said that Dewey, uh, uh, the two things that Dewey talked about a lot uh, it, that he had gotten from the technique, one was a much better body awareness, and he was particularly proud of the flexibility of his rib cage, which apparently was quite unusual in a person that uh, as old as he was. And the other thing that she said, he said to her, was that he found that after Alexander lessons, he was much better able to be in a discussion with someone who held an opposing view and to actually listen to it and take it in without superimposing his view in opposition to it right away. That he he was more he could he could take in an an idea that he basically may not agree with, but he could let you know look at it more objectively. Perhaps it would, would be a way of putting it, and that kind of ties in with you know what the president faces or any leader faces with all these people coming at him from different directions. Yeah, well, <clears throat> that's beautiful, and I think that's that ties in with what we all have to deal with uh, from time to time, if not frequently. Um, and I think when we ask our students to open, I think we're asking them to open their minds and hearts as well as whatever else in the gross physical immediate situation is going on. And so I think that that's, um, that's a really, really important discovery of Dewey's um, in his own use. And I think that that's where if you want to talk about how Alexander Technique could lead to world peace, there's, there's a great example that to be able to really hear uh, an opposing viewpoint or uh, a point of view that's completely foreign or brand new or that you, that you know you disagree with mm-hmm. and are actually working against and yet to be able to receive it from the person um, I, I think that would be, you know, think how different things would be in the political landscape right now if if that were possible in Washington, where people are not really listening to each other, they're just hammering away with their own agendas. Um, And I think, you know, I think that that's, I think when people get into conflict with each other, um, that's one of the beauty parts of knowing Alexander work is when you can remember to, to apply that, um, you can, you can solve conflicts with the people in your life more easily and more effectively uh, because you're not sort of end gaining, getting ahead of yourself. Uh, you're able to stay with yourself and receive 
Um, and so his flexibility of his rib cage extended to the flexibility of his his will or his mind. That's beautiful. And I think Alexander teachers are uniquely uniquely qualified to be aware of how rigid thinking gets in people's ways because we've all had the experience over and over and over again at uh, telling strangers or acquaintances what the Alexander technique is and getting these really odd reactions that are that make it clear that that what we're talking about is so far out of their conception of what's possible that they just reject it out of hand um you know so i i think we we we're on the receiving end of that um sort of inflexible reaction to a new idea all the time yes that's very true um that's i was just thinking of a a new student that i started with recently who um like many people that are looking for help are looking for help right away um, and the biggest interference in this woman's life right now is that she's that she rushes through everything mm-hmm. and is then surprised at the results of that and frustrated that she's not accomplishing what she wants to accomplish. And the challenge of learning to slow down um, and and look and observe and notice um, is a really big challenge, and there's a lot of rigid thinking in, um, no, I need to solve this problem yesterday. And um, the, the, there's actually fear in her around slowing down and considering a new way of thinking, a new way of being with herself. Um, that's just the first example that comes to mind because it's the most recent one. Um, but that's really, uh, that's really a, a situation that um, that I think has gotten... Um, I don't know. I, I see it really growing, and I'm thinking one of the other things I was thinking about with this Dewey quote and technology and how we relate to technology. Um, we we expect everything to happen instantly. Um, you mm-hmm. power up your computer and you go on the internet and you you Google something to get information, and and there is a lot of instant information at our fingertips. Um, and we're used to fast food and we're, you know, we've, we've got this technology that, uh, re- really reinforces, um, instant gratification and instant answers. Um, and, um, so I, you know, I think that, um, it's not, I mean, when things change in a lesson or in me, um, when I'm applying Alexander thinking in my daily life, the change is instantaneous, um, but the habit itself over time takes takes some time to change. So in the moment, yes, you can change anything. It changes in an instant. But consistently practicing um, does take some time. Mm-hmm. And so, I, you know, um, we are, and I'm certainly not the first one to say this um, at all, but, you know, is technology using us or are we using it? Um, right. Yeah, <laughs> that, is, that is the question today, isn't it? And, and that's more, really... More than ever before. Yeah. You know, Dewey is saying we, we have this amazing power to control the forces of nature, but now we're really at their mercy. We're at our own mercy. We've created this thing that we're now uh, enslaved to if we let ourselves be, if exactly. we don't wake exactly. up. Um, and, uh, and so that's where I think, you know, <laughs> just learning to uh, move in and out of a chair, you know, the the chair for, I know oftentimes... Uh, this gets quoted um, that Alexander said, you know, it's not the furniture, it's you. <laughs> you know, right, it's not, right. yes, it's, you know, some some chairs are more supportive of good use than others, but it doesn't matter how great your chair is if you're, you know, it's up to you how you use it. And and that's that's true of any technology. Um, mm-hmm. Exactly. And, yes, that's a very good analogy because you, <laughs> you can slump in, a, in the perfect chair. Um, and you can use yourself well in a in a terrible chair, and that's a very that's a really perfect analogy because a chair is a form of uh, technology. Actually, for in, in the West, relatively recent in our history, that people use chairs a lot. So, yeah. Well, maybe maybe that I think that might be a good place to <laughs> to bring our conversation to an end. What do you think? Yeah, I think so, too. I think, you know, just to ground ourselves back in the most mundane, everyday uses of ourselves, um, because 
that's what we have tangible and available to us. Exactly. Standing at the sink and washing dishes, it's hard to control, you know, the drone program or closing Guantanamo Bay and what's the thinking that goes into that. <laughs> right, right. Um, but we do have control over, you know, how we use ourselves if we Absolutely. want to. <laughs> and I think I should probably just mention, which I don't think I did earlier, about who this Dewey is we're talking about. Just very briefly, he was, he was well, he's first of all America's most famous philosopher. He died about 50-odd years ago. He, his, he was very famous in the field of pragmatism. But uh, maybe more importantly, he is often uh, thought of as the father of American education. He he was the main influence on American education in the first half of the last century. So he was a pretty important person, and a life pretty well. He, a long time student of Alexander wrote the introduction to three of Alexander's books. So Amy, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. It's been a great pleasure. This has been fun.